Hi everyone. January then, the month where many of us make New Year's resolutions. What are your New Year's resolutions for the year ahead? In the internet activist's calendar, January has historically become known as a month that defined the decade. Nearly a decade ago, the internet was being attacked, not by geeks, but by the US government. And the year was 2012. And one of the champions in this story is cyber activist and coding legend Aaron Schwartz. Thousands of internet users followed Aaron's decisive action, making activists out of anyone and everyone, daring them to challenge old thinking. People campaigned online and also protested in the streets, basically to save the internet. Think of it like a knowledge extinction rebellion. So episode two of Up Your English, Aaron Schwartz, the internet's good downloader. Before getting into the main part of this episode, I want to explain a little bit about the idea. I'll be your guide as we journey into looking at a topic that explores issues related to disobedience, mixing in ideas from technology, society and culture, basically our daily lives. I'll talk about the things I'm interested in and hope you will also be interested in discovering more about. And what about the format of this podcast? Head over to the website upyourenglish.net and you can get access to a transcript uh, accompanying each episode. Some of these episodes have been re-recorded from an academic lecture series on technology and society. So let me tell you something about that. Most people who do podcasts usually have, let's say, a proper job. You know, they make a living. Podcasting, you might say, is moonlighting. It's a side hustle. It's not the main gig. So in my professional daily life, I'm employed at an information science engineering school called EPITA. E-P-I-T-A. There I coach apprenticeship students in English and also do a course on technology and ethics. So putting the two together, Up Your English offers a chance to improve your vocabulary and language expression whilst also sharing contemporary ideas. Sharing ideas in any language, let alone a second language, should be on everybody's list. For this episode, we will travel back to look at one year in the life of anti-hero, a 26-year-old cyber activist, Aaron Schwartz. Between the years 2012 and 2013, he went from riding a wave of celebration in January 2012, publicly winning against the US government. To a sad low point, January 2013, Schwartz was sadly found hanged in his Brooklyn apartment just that year later. Aaron Schwartz's lifetime resolution was ingrained in him to promote access to knowledge for the betterment and advancement of a fairer and balanced society. His internet disobedience rightly brought him fans, but oh yes, also made him prey to the brutal and the corrupt justice system. Aaron Schwartz, the internet's good downloader. Schwartz was a rebel with a cause and his fight was against wealth disparity. His combat tools of choice, his own charisma, and his skill with code. Oozing with charisma, the cyber activist could easily rally protesters for causes close to his heart, both online but also at street level. However, through his selfless activities, Schwartz became a target of an unjust US government law. That law is called the CFAA the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. He was just one of many. And in short, what is it that highlights Schwartz's story over others? It's that he had more of a public persona than many of the others who were documented. Usual prosecutions under the CFAA 
were about financial or credit card fraud, but Schwartz's only crime was to be curious, showing that access to knowledge was a basic human right. Ahead of unpacking what the CFAA, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, stands for, let's look at the pivotal moment where Schwartz plays a role in stopping one of the most brutal copyright regulations in the history of internet law. January 2012, it's the time the Obama administration were forced to kill the bill before it was even enacted. This bill was called the SOPA, the S-O-P-A, the Stop Online Piracy Act. Okay, so SOPA was a law proposed as a pro-copyright law at its highest order. Its full name, the Stop Online Piracy Act. At its root, it sounds fine, but the word piracy is key here. The US government were lost on how to combat the minds of talented, curious coders. So this regulating law was sold as a protecting intellectual property law. But on the negative side, this meant no more sharing in any shape or form. No innovation. Criminal penalties imposed anything up to five years in prison for simply sharing cultural references. And you have to keep in mind that the internet at this time was a creative outlet for the whole online sharing and remix culture that, well, we have today. Ending the Stop Online Piracy Act has become legendary in the Knowledge Internet timeline, which is partly due to how it was won. It was won using intelligence. Schwartz was a visionary and he pioneered the internet as a good force for disseminating knowledge. And Aaron is in fact the main proponent of today's modern online petition websites. At the time in 2012, his petition website demandprogress.org acted as a tool for migrating an antiquated paper petitioning system to be more rapid and more quickly delivered. For Aaron, the internet gave power to the civilians. So a mass event of civil disobedience, which was initiated as an online petition, eventually hit the streets and floored the US government into submission. The convergence of online and street-level activism then collided with sufficient energy that on the 18th of January 2012, even major websites joined the protest. They kind of went offline. Homepages like Wikipedia, Reddit, Google, Mozilla, and even Flickr and maybe GoDaddy should be added there. They went black. On the one hand maybe to symbolise censorship, and on the other hand, to maybe mourn the possible death of the internet through SOPA. Overnight then, the US Senate majority obviously having had a sleepless night shifted from its 84 and 31 against position, swinging to a massive 101 against the SOPA bill. The bill was killed, and Aaron's job in publicly fixing the internet had just begun. The architecture, or let's say the plumbing of the internet we use today, does not resemble in any shape or form the internet which Aaron successfully campaigned for. His memory does though stir debate. Today we continue to talk about the provenance of knowledge on the internet. We pose questions like who owns its access? Is knowledge only accessible to those who can afford it? Is knowledge in fact a luxury item? Aaron was asking these questions at the same time in the late noughties, 2000s, to challenge an antiquated copyright system, which itself was being sucked into a massive online sharing network, our internet. Here's a brief chronology of Schwartz's innovations at such a young age. At 12 years old, he won the attention of the adults in the room for inventing an online collaborative encyclopedia, the info.org going on to win a prestigious award in the category of creator for online tools for education and collaboration. At 14, 
He then drafted the specification which, which updates today's modern websites, and that's called RSS. And what motivated him? He mainly saw technology as imperfect. His ideas were forming at the time when the internet was propagating a free culture philosophy, basically file sharing, uploading and downloading. The institutions relying on analog copyright principles couldn't keep up now that more things were being put online. People were sharing ideas, music, film, books, anything that could be digitized and at such a rapid speed Aaron brought his level of thinking and technical ability to the problem and set out to modernize, well, let's call it to modernize the copyright law. Though this shift was a great advantage for knowledge sharing. Some, including governments, saw this as a digital wild west. And it's here the duel would be fought. The US government saw a hinterland for disobedient rogues. Schwartz also saw it as a digital wild west himself. But with little interest in making money, his ambition was solely to fix the web. So not yet in the sights of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI. At just 15 years old, he built a tool which would redefine the boundaries of online copyright law. You'll know this as Creative Commons. It's a license used today on modern websites like Flickr. To understand the impact Aaron has played in this story of curiosity and disobedience, it is crucial to look at the political and academic terrain in which the knowledge internet existed. Why am I using this term knowledge internet? It's a term I've decided characterizes how the internet was developing in the years running up until Schwartz's untimely death. This includes corners of the web for uploading and disseminating citizen knowledge, geeky knowledge and research knowledge. Each of these became known, one as Wikipedia, the Encyclopedia for General Citizens, then we have Reddit, the geeky corner of the web, and then online academic journal repositories such as JSTOR for cataloging published research. So let's dissect this Wikipedia, Reddit, JSTOR imperative. Their use came at a time of a free culture movement. But as we've seen, Schwartz wasn't advocating free, but more correctly, access. And he was criticizing publishing companies for creating what was to become a competitive marketplace of ideas and knowledge. The internet's own punk. An original thinker, Schwartz is the mind behind many of today's major domestic internet protocols, the plumbing and pipelines making it actually flow. In the wake of Schwartz's death, he leaves as his legacy a trail of salient internet functionalities which he either built solely or co-authored using his knowledge and his abilities. To upload a blog post, for instance, to edit a Wikipedia entry, to read the news on your iPhone, to easily find podcasts, to use Flickr photos, to petition governments online. All of these are in his canon. With these being his main creations, tools which embrace the remix culture of the late noughties, the 2000s, I want to plant this question for you to consider. And that is why. Why does a government push back so hard against a visionary like Aaron Schwartz? Especially where they're trying to bring order to and not only this antiquated copyright system, but also to improve every citizen's access to knowledge. This brings us on to looking at the unfair CFAA, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which even today remains unjust and a rogue law. To do this, let's backtrack slightly. During the time that Schwartz was petitioning against SOPA, the Stop Online Piracy Act, and winning, Behind the scenes, the FBI, uh, you know, they were building a case against Schwartz. He'd become its poster boy enemy, a prodigious cyber activist, was fair game. Critics of the CFAA say it's a one-size-fits-all sledgehammer for smashing anything and anyone seemingly disobedient. So Schwartz had his optimism battered and diminished to a point 
of No Return, Suicide. A year after the Sopa win, Schwartz, as we heard earlier, was discovered hanged on the 11th of January 2013 in his Brooklyn apartment. So why is the CFAA such a bad deal? Let's look at it through the level of computational power that was available during the time it was created in 1986. Computer equipment was mainframe. We had green ASCII text, black screen monitors, clunky keyboards. For heaven's sake, we're even talking Microsoft Windows 1.0, please. In 1986, state-of-the-art tech was the noisy modem and financial institutions, well, were the main tech innovators. With that in mind, the CFAA was actually used to prosecute against financial fraud. But Schwartz was not interested in money, we know that. His currency was knowledge. But Aaron's ability and vision to build tools to help disseminate and share knowledge seemed to hit a seismic wave in government circles. The US government became paranoid, reactionary, defensive, and they'd found a way to protect knowledge access in the form of this antiquated law, the CFAA, which they retrofitted to destroy the boy who was simply trying to modernize copyright law for the knowledge internet. Now, like many people, I'm not against the need for copyright. Of course, artists and producers need to be paid. But copyright itself comes from a time way before the information superhighway. Schwartz understand well this dilemma. There were growing commercial and corporate uses of the information highway, but the internet was originally envisaged as a free access space for connecting and sharing knowledge and ideas. By 2011, knowledge was quickly being commercialized as a corporate currency. This was by educational journal publishers, you know, charging extortionate subscription fees to access its databases. Journal publishers had then, as Schwartz said, become gatekeepers of knowledge, as they always had been. But the difference was the internet, its power for disseminating knowledge in duplicate. So on one hand, these American educational journal publishers could tantalize people with their knowledge, but lock them out if they couldn't afford the subscription fee. In Schwartz's mind, the world harbors innovative thinkers everywhere and latent talent comes from across continents. So limiting access to academic and scientific knowledge to individuals and institutions through financially prohibitive costs is immoral. Overall, his philosophy was and remains in the minds of those who continue to keep his mission alive to make access to knowledge an abundant right. Access can spark innovation. Access can ignite medical breakthroughs. And more generally so, access narrows the gap on inequality. But for all his bright thinking and new world ability, the FBI took this as a threat, overreached and began to hack at its own CFAA law to build a case against Schwartz. No longer just a bill to protect financial records, US Congress strangely decided to extend it to protect a knowledge internet. Let's open this up more. This private yet confident 26 year old American boy basically knew the internet inside out, you know, like the back of his hand. And his ability caused him to be seen as a danger to both commercial and government interests. To grasp the unjust severity of how US Congress reacted to Schwartz, I just need to add that maybe the US government sees geeks as communists. But an exception to this was Senator Zoe Lofgren. Senator Zoe Lofgren, who in memory of Schwartz, took the CFAA, tried to update it to protect innovators like himself. She called it Aaron's Law. So finally, what was Schwartz's crime? Well, none. He hadn't committed a crime. He'd simply exerted a high-level disobedience, which the US government could not get their heads around. He'd basically been caught downloading too many research papers. It sounds preposterous. He was well known for mass downloading, 
already in a previous study, he'd correlated that oil companies had been paying law professors to do vanity research, exonerating them from any environmental damage. Basically, uncovering corruption. Years later, he was arrested for having downloaded again. This time from the academic journal repository called JSTOR. It sounds preposterous. He was facing a 30-year prison sentence. So our good downloader, Schwartz, he could have taken a reduced plea of months, reduced from the maximum 30-year prison sentence being given. Colleagues also would no doubt have contributed to paying his spiralling legal costs, reaching millions of dollars. He was indicted for prosecution on no less than 11 accounts of the antiquated CFAA, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Offered a plea bargain of months rather than years, why did Schwartz then say no? We have to look at a comment from the documentary dedicated to his memory called The Internet's Own Boy. In a clip from the documentary, a close friend recalls strolling with him one day. In front of the White House, Washington DC, Schwartz turned to her declaring, I want to work there one day. She thinks, with a criminal record, even amounting to a few months, that Aaron knew no one labelled a criminal or with criminal activity could rise to government office. Aaron championed curiosity over intelligence. Be curious, read widely, try new things. A lot of what people call intelligence boils down to curiosity. Aaron Schwartz, the internet's own boy, the internet's own punk. The internet's good downloader. Born 8th of November 1986, died 11th of January 2013. That's it. That's the end of the podcast. Thank you very much for listening. And I hope it interested you and especially made you want to watch the documentary, The Internet's Own Boy. Maybe you already know about Aaron Schwartz. And if so, I'd like to know if you think he was a rebel. If you've any comments, don't hesitate to write to me and let me know about what you think. As usual, I'd like to remind you that if you like the podcast and want to help me, you can leave an evaluation on iTunes if you listen to podcasts on iTunes or on other applications you use. That way I can reach more and more listeners and help more and more people. Of course, there'll be a new podcast soon. And during that, we'll talk about optimism and the economy. Continuing the topic of rebellion and disobedience. I hope you will be there with me for the new podcast. Thank you and see you soon. Thank you.